I got it. I got it. Hey, Jim. Hello, Jim. How you doing? Good. It's good to see you. Hey, Scott. Hello. Okay. All right. How is everybody tonight? Awesome. So, just out of curiosity, oh, are we live? Okay. Online church, good to see you guys. Or is that the way you say it? Good to see you. Glad you got to see us. That's, that's it. And uh, welcome. We're going to be in, uh, we're going to be in, uh, did you, what'd you say, nine? I thought it was ten. Ten twenty. That's what it is. I kept going, wait a minute, Kay, you weren't here. But all of a sudden it dawned on me. Yeah. So 1020 is where we stop. So anyway, Exodus chapter 10, verse 20. And uh, before I actually get into the teaching, I did some investigating. I got to thinking and praying about uh, uh, the all statements that we ran into so much last week. All the cattle died. All of the livestock died. All... And it happened three times. All of them got boils, all of them, right? Actually, it's two times. And then by the time you hit the firstborn, which is the plague after the one we're going to talk about tonight, uh, then all of the firstborn of the animals die. Now, um, Lisa brought this up. She says, kids always point out when she tells the story, they always say, I thought you said all the animals died. Why are all the animals back again? Because you see the one, and the one with the uh, hail, the hail kills them, and then there's another plague, and it kills them. And uh, so here's how it's going to go, okay? So um, first of all, the timeline of the exodus and the plagues when you actually look at when it says, and he turned the, he threw his staff down and it ate the snake, that basically is a two or three day period. And so you count that. And then you look at the Nile turning to blood, that's seven days. And then from then on, it's two days, three days, two days, one day, two days. And so when you look at the days themselves, it comes out to a calculation of 26 days where Moses goes in and prays, or goes in and declares a plague, and then comes in and prays that the plague goes away. So there's 26 days. What we don't know is the time frame in between. Now, <clears throat> when you look at timeline in the Bible, you have to go by what little information they give you. Because God is not always interested in the timeline <clears throat> unless it has to do with 400 years in captivity or 70 years in captivity, 400 years before a prophet speaks, before Jesus shows up, or 400 years in exile, right? Those are the numbers that matter. The 10 plagues matter, but the reference in between how many days passed uh, in some ways is irrelevant, okay? So if you have naysayers say, well, see, it says all, and then it says all, and, and uh, some people, some theologians say it took two years for this to happen, and another says it took six months, blah, 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 because when you Google all of this, you get everything under the sun, all right? But, so you have 26 actual days that are spoken, with a plague in it or ending a plague. And sometimes it tells you how many days, like the seven days. So a couple of guys who are math guys said there's at least 50 days that hacks to happen for all of these plagues to happen because some of these plagues are not Johnny on the spot, like the one with the boils. Boils can start to happen, but before they get bad enough that Pharaoh says, enough's enough, that could be a week, that could be four days, right? Because nobody gets a boil and then within 24 hours, oh, I got to go to the hospital, this is killing me. 
it usually takes two or three days. And so when you start calculating that out, then the 26 really ends up about 50. So about 50 days of plague on the minimum. Now I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. The Hebrews say it was 12 months. Now the only way that that works in the timeline is because when Moses st- when the plagues start, Moses is 80 years old. And he dies at 120 and there's 40 years in the wilderness. So it can't be over 12 months. You understand? But the Hebrew calendar started right at the Exodus. Before that, everybody was on the same kind of calendar and it wasn't Gregorian like we are on. It was on their own calendar. Okay? So, how do we know how long it was? Well, Moses... The only way they could be in the wilderness for 40 years, but Moses is 80 years old when it starts, is he can't turn 81 yet, or it's right as he turns 81. Okay? So when you look at that, you go, okay, so how much time was it? It's irrelevant, only it can't be over a year. Okay? So when naysayers start that stuff, all the timeline and this, why does it say two years? Well, they're speculating based on no evidence. The evidence is right there in front of us in the Bible, but we don't know how much time. So it's as minimum as 50. Its maximum is 11 and a half months. And Michelle and I looked this up today. The Hebrew calendar is actually 11 and a half months compared to our 12 months. So Moses would still be 80 years old or just turn 81. So you get in that. Okay, so that's one thing to kind of... Calculate and understand if you have somebody who wants to argue it with you. And for those of you who don't know, the way I teach, the way I teach is because I've argued all of these things with somebody at some time. Right? I, I've been in construction for 40, 44 years. Okay? And hard hats like to argue. Okay? And because they like to argue and they want evidence because they're hard, you know, I take this two before, I turn it into this. I take these 22 befores, I turn it into this. I want evidence. And so I've learned through the years to argue the evidence. And the reason I do that is because that's what they can understand. And then once they understand that I'm with them, now they can have faith, right? Because now they trust you. It what? says some, some of the Egyptians took their lives off hand. <laughs> yes, so I'm going to get to that now. Now, with the all, the all is interesting. First, you need to understand who we're dealing with. Whenever you're dealing with a a country of origin, you have to understand what's culturally going on. Now, how many know that Jerusalem is like the crossroads of the world? You've probably heard that before. All of the spice... Spice travel goes through there, all of trade goes through there, north and south, east and west, because it's the same longitude, I think, latitude, latitude sideways, same latitude as Babylon, so you've got all of this trade that goes on, so Jerusalem is known for its trade. Well, guess who is known for their trade more than Jerusalem? Egypt. Egypt is a nation that has been there longer than almost any other nation. So it's one of the first nations that's actually established and has worldwide trade. And what I mean by that is if it's right after the flood, I think Pangaea has broke up at that point. To me, Pangaea broke up during the flood. So the North and South America are out of the picture because nobody's built a boat to go that far yet. Okay? Logically, after Noah. Within 500 years, though, they may have. Okay. So, how do, how do they trade there? Well, trade happens through money. Do you have gold and silver? Do you have uh, precious jewels? Do you have precious spices? Do you have oils? Right? And then there's bartering. Okay. If Egypt is known for its wheat, barley, and its flax, and... Africa is known for its oxen. How do you think they do trade? I'll give you an ox for however many bushel of this. 
right? So when you get into the all of the plagues, and let's say this is only within a 50-day time span, you ready for this? The traders don't know that there's plagues going on there yet. They don't have cell phones. They don't have telegraph. And so they're still coming, right? They come into town and they go, what has happened to the crops? We came here for that. And Pharaoh goes, shut your mouth, right? Because he's embarrassed. Shut your mouth. How much do you want for the oxen? And they buy some more. So if you take 50 days and you say, well, it actually took 11 and a half months, then they could get a restock of the animals in that period of time. It's that simple, okay? Now, why does God keep killing all? Why does he keep pounding the grain into the ground? Because he's judging the nation of Egypt. Whenever you see large-scale famines, God is either judging or he's proving a point to another nation to help the nation that this is happening to. Now, we don't understand. A lot of people say, well, that's mean. God can't do that. God created the heavens and the earth. He can do whatever he wants to. And he knows why he's doing it when we have no concept of why. Right? So, how do I know this with the judgment thing? It's simple. Anytime any nation has a, a, a pangea or a plethron, plethora of gods, they have multiple gods, God gives them 400 to 1,000 years to repent, and then here comes the hammer. How do we know that? Why does Jonah get sent to Assyria? Assyria is not... Egypt, I mean, it's not Israel. Why does he do that? Because God cares about people. Why does he send Jonah over there? They're the arch, I don't know if you think about it, but they're the arch enemy of Israel. That's why Jonah didn't want to go, because he knew God would forgive them if they repented. That's why Jonah gets so mad when they repent, right? So what is God doing with Babylon or with Assyria at Nineveh? He's actually giving them opportunity to repent. Do you know that it is proven through the Bible that they remain repentative for a hundred years? In other words, Nineveh, the pagan city that we know it to be now, actually had a hundred years of peace because they repented. It's in their history that they had a hundred years after that king repented. Oh, you mean God judges nations? Let's look at another one. Why does God send the children of Israel into Canaan? He says it's to judge the people there because of their behavior. And some people go, I just don't like it when God judges peoples and nations and, and people groups. Why does he do that? Because they are killing their babies or offering their babies or their children or their virgins to these sun gods and these uh, animal gods and these nature gods so that they get water when they need it, when they, they get crops when they need them and all of this. When God is going, I'm the only God, the whole time he's been saying that to them. And when you begin to see that, you go, oh. So, a lot of people, when you teach... Uh, the first five books of the Bible, a lot of people who get real offended by Israel judging, by God using Israel to judge the nation of Canaan, they get upset. I go, you got to remember how many years has it been since the flood? By the time they go there to judge it, it's been over 600 years, which means he's given them 600 years to repent, and they would not. See, God is pure in and of himself. He is pure. He is the absolute righteousness. He knows what right is. He knows what wrong is. And he makes everything that's wrong right. Right? He brings redemption. But that's only through repentance. Repentance is me acknowledging that I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior. 
or that I need the one who created the heavens and the earth. It's that simple. All right? The Canaanites would not do this. How do I know they've been there that long? Because you do a rough calculation on the back wall back there from the time that the Israelites go into Canaan. It's at least 600 years. It's possibly as many as 800 years from the time that Noah curses Ham's son, Canaan, which is where the name comes from. Okay? And Canaan did not repent. He never taught his kids to repent. And on and on and on for six to eight hundred years. And then God says, enough's enough. And when he sends the children of Israel in, what does he say? The land is polluted with foreign gods. And what we know of Canaan is it's polluted with the death of babies and virgins. In fact... In Israel, there is a Canaanite site that has been unearthed, and they found these um, stones that are all lined up according to the sun and according to the way the moon crosses and all that stuff according to the time of year. And there's a park there now, and you can go there and go, oh, look, it's a Canaanite high place. Isn't this cute? But they did some archaeology on it 30 years ago, and guess what they found at the base of those, bon those stones? Baby skeletons. Why did we turn that into a park? See? Why are they turning it into a park? Because, you know, all cultures have their own thing, and that's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not okay. So, what's happening in Egypt? To bring this all back around before we get going. What's happening in Egypt? Egypt has had a lot of years to repent. How do we know that? When Joseph went there... 430 years earlier, or four, yeah, roughly, 430 years earlier, he brought salvation to the land of Egypt. Did he not? Did not Pharaoh says, he serves the one and only true God? We're going to trust him and anything that he has to say. So he brought favor into Egypt, and they basically crapped on it after Joseph died. And God goes, oh, really? Oh, really? Does God have the right to say, oh, really? <laughs> yes, he does. So hopefully that will answer your question on the all and some of the timeline. We do not know the exact timeline, but it's at the minimum 50 days at the maximum 11 and a half months. And that has more to do with Moses' age than it does with anything else. Now, the reason I like to go with the 50 or 60 or 70 days, somewhere in there, is because if God is trying to get the Egyptians to repent while he's hardening their heart. Now, that's the hard part. Why is he hardening their heart? He says, to make my glory known throughout the earth. Why would he make his glory known throughout the earth? To let them know that salvation is coming. It goes back to the promise of Abraham, right? Right? And when you see that, what do you see? A plan, right? Once you see a plan, you go, I can trust God. He's got a plan. Because, you know, every time I get a plan, and it even looks like a good plan, and I start planning on the plan, and then something goes sideways, what happens? You go into plan B, or you get upset, right? <laughs> God don't get upset over plans, and he don't have plan B. He's got a plan. And so when you begin to see that, you begin to see the heart of God, which makes my faith deepen even more, right? All right, so we're going to pray, and then we are going to go into... I'm going to pick up in verse 16 of chapter 10, uh, just to get in the flow of this. All right, Father... In the name of Jesus, I thank you for the day. I thank you for this time. I thank you for explanation. Father, there are so many things in the Bible uh, because we're Americans and we don't understand Middle Eastern culture for the most part. I mean, we understand bits and pieces of it, but we don't understand it overall. And we sure don't understand cultures and things like that from 4,000 years ago, roughly. Father, so uh, we need explanation. And I thank you for explanation because it actually deepens our faith. Uh, but Father, regardless of that 
this kind of explanation. We thank you for you bringing Jesus, your only begotten son, the one who came as a servant, who laid his life down for our sins so that we might be in you. That's the coolest part, so that we might be in you and that you would be in us. Father, we thank you for Jesus' gift of salvation through uh, putting our sins to death. And we thank you for the resurrection that shows us that there is a plan after we die. Father, thank you for loving us and using us for your glory. Give us ears to hear, minds to, eyes to see, minds to understand, and hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... Uh, Exodus chapter 10, verse 16, Pharaoh, this is right after the um, grasshoppers. Uh, Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. And I talked about that briefly last week. I think that is fascinating that he actually repents or he doesn't repent. He's sorry for what he did wrong against Moses even, Right. Forgive my sin just this once and plead with the Lord your God to take away this death from me. Why does, this, why does he say this death? Because now whatever wheat or barley was not destroyed uh, with the hail has now been destroyed by the locust. And you need to understand he has literally, by the time we hit the last plague, which is the death of the firstborn, he has literally taken everything from Egypt of value except the Nile. Everything. Wow. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and pleaded with the Lord. The Lord responded by shifting the wind, and the strong west wind blew the locust into the Red Sea. Not a single locust remained in all the land of Egypt. And But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again, so he refused to let the people go. I know there's several teenagers or kids in the room. Just so you know, what do we call a cicada in Oklahoma? A locust. What is it really? A cicada. So what's a locust here? It's a grasshopper. But we call them different things than they do in the Middle East. That's all it is. All right? Okay. Then the Lord, verse 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. Once again, we're calculating some days. Here's three days of darkness. During all that time, the people could not see each other, and no one moved, but there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. What? So think about this. That means the sun did not seem to come up or set during any of this, and the moon never showed its face. But not only that, it makes me think, since they didn't move, that you know how light permeates the darkness? You know, I can leave this room on uh, tonight and I can flip all the lights off and if that little lamp is off you cannot see nothing because there is no light source in this room right mm -hmm. I flip that light on and all of a sudden I can make out the chairs on this end enough that I don't fall over them <laughs> because many times I'm the first one in the room right it's darker than that in other words God did he reveal this to me or, or basically say, Jim, have you ever thought about this? I don't know. But he said to me today, this is, a, this is a point that I didn't let the light permeate the darkness. In other words, the darkness overcame it. The opposite. Because he's the God of the light and the dark. Right? It's, it's his creation... He can mess with it anytime he wants to, and especially if prayer is involved. What is it? Uh, is it? Is it Joshua, the one that prays? Yes, Joshua is the one that prays for the sun to stand still. 
And it did. In fact, mathematicians have calculated that there's an extra day. They don't know where it came from. And it goes back to the Bible, this one day, right? So here we have either the light cannot permeate the darkness. In other words, if you had a candle and you had it right here, you might read a word. Whereas normally in darkness, if you had a candle, you could read everything on this page if it was right here. Or like this, without dripping wax on here, right? But evidently, it's not that way. So, either the sun is no longer... Now, this kind of rocked my world for a minute, because now you're messing with the natural. You mean the sun didn't cross the sky, nor the moon, in those three days over Egypt, but it did not 60 miles away? Now, you want to talk about a miracle, that's a miracle, but then the other side of it is, did he just let darkness descend on Egypt only? It didn't mess with Ethiopia. It didn't mess with Ethiopia. It didn't mess with anybody else, right? The people sailing in the Mediterranean were still sailing in the Mediterranean. The people in the Gulf of Agaba, still on the, on the water doing it. They're out there. Hi. She woke up. And they're still out there paddling on their kayaks, right? I mean, today. Anyway, so, but do you see? It's ridiculous. It's so dark they can't see one another. And then it's as if they're wearing it. Have you ever, now I know we got people that are afraid of the dark in here, and I understand that. When I was young, I was. And let me tell you, when I used to walk, 10 years old, I walk out in the dark, I swore it was like a coat on me. Get it off. Right? Am I wrong? It's terrifying. So it must have been like that. Finally, Pharaoh called for Moses. <laughs> have you ever thought of how he would do that? In absolute darkness where you couldn't walk without falling over? I think he's just standing in the palace screaming. <laughs> and Moses goes, I hear something. Because he's in the land of Goshen. He's going, to the south, I hear something. It's Pharaoh, Moses! Anyway, am I the only one that sees that? <laughs> yeah, or he's coming along like this. Yeah. All right. Finally, Pharaoh called for Moses, go and worship the Lord, he said, but leave your flocks and herds here. Now, he's done this two or three times where he says, you can go, but, right? Most of the time, he says, I'm not going to let you go. You may even take your little ones with you. No, Moses said, you must provide us with animals for sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord our God. Now, why would Moses say that? The land of Goshen still has animals in it. Can slaves own property? If you have a benevolent dictator, you can. But this guy ain't very benevolent. So who actually owns those? Now here's the third case scenario. Maybe the animals that are not being killed in Goshen, Pharaoh is imminent domaining them. Oh, those are mine. And pulling them down into Egypt. It's just a thought. I don't know the answer. Hi. She's used to talking when I'm preaching. No, Moses said, you must provide us with animals for sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord our God. All our livestock must go with us too. Not a hoof. Oh, look at that. Moses gets pretty testy here, doesn't he? Not a hoof can be left behind. We must choose our sacrifices for the Lord our God from among these animals. And we won't know how we are to worship the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart once more. Why does he keep hardening his heart? He wants to show his glory throughout the world. He's also showing his glory to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, after they leave, I believe, actually has a real opportunity to repent. But he doesn't. Okay? Pharaoh shouted at Moses, Get out of here! I'm warning you, never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Now, I think that's fascinating. If he really thought he could kill Moses... Why didn't he threaten him with this nine other times or eight other times? But he knew the Lord his God was protecting him. 
Just think about that. Pharaoh has been afraid the whole time. See what you learn about bullies? They're actually scaredy cats. If you ever truly stand up to one, take the whooping they got to give and show up the next day and take the whooping again, by the third time they're tired of you. And in fact, they will go around you. How do I know that? Because I lived in that world growing up, right? I was never a good enough fighter, but I was tough enough. I could take whatever you had to give, right? So, very well, watch Moses reply. I will never see your face again. Now, what's crazy to me about that, if Pharaoh doesn't ever see his face again, then Pharaoh loses all the blessings that are actually happening to him during this judgment. Remember last week I talked about whenever God curses, there's always a blessing within it? I've seen that over and over and over. Let me show you the blessing here. Egypt's still a nation to this day. Remember Jericho was never supposed to be rebuilt. If it did, it was going to cost you your firstborn. Remember that? Remember the guy that began to try to build it again during the ages of the kings? What happened? His firstborn died, and he stopped. He didn't build it back. And the place where Jericho is is still rubble, am I right? They built one near it and called it Jericho, but not where it was because there had been enough people see, you don't want to mess with God on this. All right? Very well, Moses said, I will never see your face again. Here we go, chapter 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will strike Pharaoh in the land of Egypt with one more blow. This almost sounds like God working on a punching bag, doesn't it? You ever thought about God's ultimate goal in punishment is always to get you to repent? But once a nation or a people group will not repent, then he says, all right, then everybody must die. And when you see judgment at the end of the age, what is that? We have had so much history to tell us that this is true. It's not even funny. So now it takes more faith to disagree with it and to argue against it and to not believe it than it does to actually believe it. It actually takes less faith for me and you to believe this than it does for an atheist to not believe it. The evidence is overwhelming. After that, Pharaoh will let you leave this country. In fact, watch this. In fact, he will be so eager to get rid of you that he will force you all to leave. Tell all the Israelite men and women, watch this, to ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Now the Lord had caused the Egyptians to look favorable upon the people of Israel, and Moses was considered a very great man in the land of Egypt, respected by Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptian people alike. Now why do you think that is? He's the only person who ever stood up to Pharaoh. But he wasn't doing it alone. There was this God behind him. You know that, that um, what is it? Uh, there's a movie that came out in the late 80s, early 90s, where the guy had this protector with him all the time. I forget what the name of the movie was, but it was great. It's My Bodyguard or something like that. And the, the bullies couldn't deal with this guy anymore, this guy that was picking on, because this big kid was always behind him going, enough. Same thing here. He said, God said in the beginning of this, I will make you look like God to Pharaoh. So the people of Egypt actually see Moses like a God, bigger than all of their gods. Now Moses, because he's the most humblest man that ever, li li ever lived, doesn't see himself that way. See, that's where humility comes in for the Christian. If we've got God on our side, we should not be afraid of nothing. But we should deal with people as if we want them to see Jesus, not us. Right? Uh, verse 4. Moses had announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. At midnight tonight I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt. From the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock. Here we go. There's still livestock? Remember what I said about the traders? Remember what I just said about possibly the land of Goshen? Pharaoh actually owned those animals. 
uh, the first horn of all the livestock will die also. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has ever heard before or will ever again. Wow. Now, this is similar to the sound that it says you will hear from Bethlehem from the sound of Rachel's children at the loss of the children and them weeping. Only this says like nothing it's ever been heard before. That's because a whole nation loses its firstborn. Wow. that's. But among the Israelites, it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. I've read this a hundred times and I don't ever remember seeing that. Not even a dog will bark. So not even the dog having pups will have a pup that will die because of this. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. All, and why is that? Because God is judging Egypt. He's not judging Israel. Israel will be judged, believe it or not. There was some judgment that happened during the uh, Holocaust. And I'm not saying that as if that's a good thing. That's a scary thing. At the same time, there will be judgment again when the Antichrist shows himself in the temple. It's going to happen again, right? See, so judgment comes for everyone. There's judgment comes for Americans. America is actually under judgment right now. We may have enough time to do something about it, and we may not. Nevertheless, I'm following God to the end. I don't care if I die in the judgment because of it. Because... As an American, I deserve it from the things we've allowed to happen in this country. So, that's just part of the deal. At the same time, it's possible that we may not, if we repent, and we've seen repentance, believe it or not, I'm just going to be blunt honest, when Roe versus Way kind of got pushed to the side, some of that judgment went, and you go, why? Because we're a nation killing babies. Whenever God judges a nation, three things are happening every time. They are killing babies. They, homosexuality is rampant and considered normal. And a nation turns its back on God or the prophets that were sent there. I can't help it. I didn't make the rules. When you study the Bible, that's the three things you see every time. Right? So what does that look like? I have no idea. If we don't go into nuclear war, that means many of us will survive, and maybe we'll survive to, to replant this nation with new converts for Jesus. Right? And i got to love my brother as myself. And I'm going to say this to anybody who preps. Nothing wrong with prepping. But you need to understand something. If somebody's standing in your yard and your grandkids are in your house and they're begging for food, you are not going to shoot them just because they're in your yard. Amen. You're going to love that neighbor as yourself. Right. You're going to share what you got, just like the widow of Nain, even if it's her last meal. That's, right. That's what a Christian does. Okay? And I have guns, so I'm saying that to me too. <laughs> anyway, but I have guns for a different reason. They're currency. <laughs> all, the, all the officials of Egypt will run to me and fall to the ground before me. Let me say that again. All of the officials will run to me and fall to the ground before me. Please leave. They will beg, hurry, and take your followers with you. Only then will I go. Then, burning with anger, Moses left Pharaoh. Now the Lord had told Moses earlier... Pharaoh will not listen to you, but then I will do even more mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed these miraculous f signs in Pharaoh's presence, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would let the Israelites leave their country. Uh, did you notice that Aaron gets na named here again after six plagues? So it's as if Moses didn't need Aaron anymore, but God has already set Aaron apart, and because God has set Aaron apart, he's still significant. But what happened to Moses' stuttering and his fear in front of people? Went away. Once the Spirit starts talking in you, all of that goes away. 
right? Now, now this seems kind of odd, but chapter 11 is the beginning of this last plague, and then it goes into kind of a summary, and then we go to the first Passover. For, so half of ch chapter 12 is the Passover rules, which are from now on, and the other half is actually the judgment. So it's, the way it's written is kind of, uh, I don't know if I'd have wrote it that way. You know what I mean? Sometimes you look at the Bible like that and go, why did they do that? When Moses is writing this, it's always a reminder. So he's telling you the crux of what's going to happen. Then he goes into a summary of what's happened. And then he goes into the rules of what Passover means, which is now from generation to generation. And then he goes back into actually what happens. So we'll see how far we get. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announced this to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. Now, why is this significant? This is where the Hebrew calendar was born. Up until this point, whatever calendar was used, it was either by people group or it was global. They all had the same, and it probably was not the Gregorian, which is what we're in. Uh, they, might have, they might not have even... I know they counted years because when you look at the deal on the back row, that is a history of the Hebrew lineage based on the number of years they lived. So that's not Hebrew years. That, to me, is year years or whatever the normal was before the Hebrew calendar came along. Okay. Okay, so where, okay. So announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat the whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Isn't that cool? Divide the animal. Do you notice how God always takes care of the poor? He always takes the care of those who have the least. And then Jesus shows up, and who does he go to first? The ones who have the least. That's the heart of God, right? Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select, watch this, must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or goat, without no defects. So none of that has changed for 38 years hundred years. Isn't that amazing? According to the Hebrews, they follow this to the letter of the law. How do we know that? Because we still see them do it. And then we've had the first five books of the Bible for quite some times, but then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and they found this all over again. And they're still doing exactly what it says. You want to talk about people who can follow, follow the letter of the law? It's amazing right? But the law doesn't save them. Only the sacrifice does. Now watch this. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. That means when the, what we call last light. Now I want you to notice this month, and I want you to notice the day, and I want you to notice that it's Passover, and I want you to notice this is exactly when Jesus was killed. Now you tell me God ain't got a plan. They are to, ta huh? They get it on the 10th and kill it on the 14th. Exactly, and they're supposed to live in their house for those four days. Those four days. Now check this out. So Jesus, I don't know if you noticed this, he ate Passover with the disciples, but there's no mention of them buying a lamb. <laughs> Why? Because he was the sacrifice, and he was the lamb, and he was already living with them. Wow. Yes. 
They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over fire and eat it along with the bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the legs, head, and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before the morning. Why can they not boil it? Because all sacrifices that are dealing with sin have to have passed through the fire. Judgment comes through the fire. I just want you to see that. The judgment on that sacrifice. It's, it's interesting when you're eating the animal. Now, Jesus, you go, where's the fire in his sacrifice? It's interesting, but when God turns his back on Jesus, it's the same as the fire burning the animal up. That's why Jesus died so quickly in the day. The fire for Jesus was not being in the presence of God for that three hours, four hours, six hours, moment, whatever it was. It's very interesting. Do not leave any of it until next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed. Wear your sandals and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt, strike down every firstborn son and every firstborn male in the in animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against the gods of Egypt. Here we go. He don't, he don't put up with multiple gods. Uh, by the way, it is not uncommon in America now that anybody on any given block, you just go... If you got the guts, just go down the block and ask them what uh, faith they are. I guarantee you on every block in Ardmore, there's at least one set of pagans that are there. You go back 40 years in our history, that would be impossible. But now that's normal. I've invited people to church that say, I don't want to come because I'm pagan. And I said, you're perfect. I'd love for you to come to church. Now, why would you say that to me? I said, because I want to introduce you to the God you need to be following. And they go, well, that's kind of judgmental. No, you don't even know what you're doing. And I'm telling you, once you meet the God I serve, you will realize how insufficient paganism is. Okay, I'll check you out. <laughs> I had one do that one time. He was actually a warlock, and he sat right back there, right in the middle for three months every Sunday and just stared at me the whole time. But every time I'd go out there and I'd say, hey, Richard, how you doing? He'd go, I'm okay. I didn't like what you had to say today. I said, I'm sorry. I said, it's really good to see you. And he'd be back next week. So he either was either trying to put spells on me or curses or something, but Jesus was outweighing that because I was just killing him with kindness, right? I will execute judgment against the, all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, this is kind of fun. I've heard it, and I'll end with that. We'll pick up at 14 next week. But I've heard it said through the years... Well, they say the eyes are the window of the soul, right? And uh, we're supposed to, I can't get into the ears too much, but when you look at a house, every house has a door. Whether there's a door on it or not is irrelevant. There's a door opening, right? And if you're watching The Chosen, if you notice, they always kiss the door jam as they go in. They kiss their hand and they touch the door jam. That's reminding them of the Passover. But the other thing that's fascinating to me, I was uh, in prison ministry years ago, and this prisoner who was a Bible scholar, man, this guy knew more than I will ever know. And he looked at me one time, he says, I've been studying this a long time, I figured out this whole lentil and doorpost thing. I said, really? He goes, yeah, aren't the eyes the window of the soul? And I said, yeah. He goes, the lentil, the forehead. 
and the ears are the doorpost. Everything that comes into you comes in through the eyes or the ears. And I went, oh, wow. You think about the Passover is covering your eyes and your ears because we're supposed to pay attention to what comes into us, right? Otherwise, garbage in, garbage out. Anyway, that was a fascinating concept to me, and it's really stuck with me, and I've thought about it a lot. And I realized that when, when I am the most prone to sin for me is when something comes in my eyes, not always my ears, which means so Jesus' blood covers my eyes and my ears. My, it's just a thought, but there's just, it actually covers all of us. But have you ever thought, now check this out, in the fourth dimension, where the devil lives, right? <laughs> because we're three-dimensional. We live in a three-dimensional space. But in the fourth dimension where spirits are, you think he sees blood on our lentil and our doorpost? <laughs> he's he, yes, he's the, he's the one that wants us to think it's not there, right? But I see the blood of Christ covering my sins. So I think it's more than that. But it's just a thought. It's just one of those things that makes you ponder. And I love to, guys, what keeps me hooked in the Bible, honestly, on the days that I don't hear from the Lord or the weeks or maybe a month. There's been times in my life, months, two months goes by, I haven't heard from the Lord. But I can read the Word, right? Now, since cancer and all that stuff, I hear from Him all the time. Part of that's because I'm cued into His voice better than I ever have, right? And Chris and I were talking about that today. He was saying to him that God have a kind of a conversation with him. And what I love is when we know it's a God conversation, when it lines completely up with everything he says in the Word. And the devil can't duplicate that. Not when it lines up with everything in the Word. So um, anyway, um, I forget where I was going with that. Where was I going, Vicky? Okay. <laughs> Passover. <laughs> yes. And, and so in the fourth dimension, the devil sees us as a blood-covered glow in the dark. And like it or not, which means you've got a big target on your back. But the cool thing is, is we serve the one who created the world, and we serve him and serve alone, and because of that, there's also a shield of protection because we are, uh, we are like David when he went into battle or Jonathan when he went into battle. His armor bearer always went with him. Have you ever thought your Holy Spirit is actually your armor bearer? <laughs> one of my favorite, I'll end with this, one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible is when Jonathan, when, when Saul makes that stupid vow and says, nobody shall eat. The rest of the day until we've defeated the enemy. And they hadn't even engaged the enemy yet. Well, Jonathan was out somewhere else. And Jonathan found some honey. And he went, man, I'm starving. He dipped his uh, knife in the honey and did this. And all of a sudden, he came to himself. And he looked at his armor bearer. And he says, if we go up on that hill and we engage the Philistines. And if they invite us up to fight. Now, think about that. Philistines aren't going to invite you up to fight. Philistines fight. That's what they do, right? He says, if they invite us up to fight, will you have me? He says, I got your back. Whatever you say, that's what we'll do. Jonathan goes to the edge of the hill. Hey, you guys want to fight? Yeah, come on up. And they killed 20 of them on their way up, which you're always in a disadvantage when you're fighting uphill. And they killed 20 of them, and all of a sudden they start running, and then over the, over the other side of the mountain is where Saul is with the army. And all of a sudden, the Philistines start running. And somebody goes, I don't know what's happening. And he goes, where's Jonathan? And they go, oh, that's what's happened. Jonathan engaged the enemy, just him and the armor bearer. And they routed the whole Philistine army. That's a picture of us with the Holy Spirit. We do not have to be afraid. And we do not have to be afraid when we engage the enemy. In fact, if we will stand in confidence, in the love and the confidence of the Lord, the enemy doesn't know what to do with us. Amen. So then you love the person. I know we're supposed to hate the sin, but you can love the person. Amen. 
And it's amazing what happens when we do that. I want you to be thinking about that. Let's pray. Father, in the holy name of Jesus, I thank you for all that you've done in all of our lives. Everybody in this room and everybody that's watching us by video. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. And I pray that before we go to bed tonight, we will have a memory of many of those memories of things that you have done for us. So that we will go to bed thanking you for all that you have done. Because when we thank you for all that you have done, we have worshipped on a whole nother level. Father, thank you for what you do in our lives and the opportunities you give us. Thank you for this story and the Bible. This beautiful book that you have preserved for our generation. That we get to know these stories and we get to see the big things that you have done. Which then make us long for the big things you're fixing to do. And Father, we know it's coming because we're seeing prophecies being fulfilled every day right now. It is ridiculous. We know the time is short, but we don't live in fear. We live looking forward to your return. Father, I thank you for Jesus and the cross and that beautiful thing he's going to do when he comes through that eastern gate. And whether we're with him or not right there, we'll be able to see it. We'll be able to see it on TV, on our phone, or we'll see it from glory, or we'll see it from the army that's with him when he comes. Father, we look forward to your return, and we thank you for what you're doing, because you're still doing big things. And somehow you keep using us knuckleheads, and we love you for that, just like you used those disciples who didn't have a clue what they were doing. But Father, then, when they were filled with the Spirit, hell had to run from them. That's an amazing picture. Father, use us in that way for your glory. And bless every ear that heard this tonight and help them to have a drive in their heart to share your word with everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a great evening. Yes? On the what? Takes too much time. No. There is the other thing. I like that. She said that if the meat is boiled, there's not a pleasing aroma. <laughs>